We've been asked to start by saying a couple of things, uh, explaining roughly who we are uh, and roughly why we're here, which I suspect we all have a few clues on. Um, my marketing department, whenever I'm asked to do these kind of things, at the bottom of my briefing notes always say, be inspirational. Um, I'm afraid I won't be inspirational, but I will, um, I will try my best to be vaguely interesting uh, and try not to argue with my father. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, have ever been interviewed alongside your, your father. It's quite difficult. Uh, so if you would all just be kind. Um, if we start squabbling, please, can you turn the camera on? Um, so as um, announced, I am James, the great-grandson of Agatha Christie, uh, and this is Matthew, my father, who is by association, therefore, the grandson. Um, I took over from my father as executive chairman of um, Agatha Christie Limited about two years ago. Uh, he managed to do about 40 years in the job without messing it up. Uh, it's now my job to, to carry on uh, with, the, um, with the mantle. Um, we've probably been uh, announced here as uh, the Agatha Christie estate. Um, this feels to me like something of a mis misnomer. It feels like something that is moribund, dead, um, and inanimate. Um, I think you can probably see that both of us uh, are still quite alive. I like to think I'm a bit more alive than him, but um, we're doing all right. Um, we are a business that was set up in the 1950s. We are still a um, largely family business. Uh, the family owns a, a large proportion of the, of the company. Um, and, and we run the business, but we do have partners and we are run along very, very much business lines and, and always have been. We are a very active management business. We proactively manage uh, in the publishing sphere, in TV uh, stage, and obviously in this case, we're here to talk about, about the movie. Um, one of the things I try and do in my life is, is listen to as little as possible that my father tells me. Um, however, I think I've occasionally had the knack of, of, of taking on the board the things that really matter. Uh, one of his lessons to me in business was to choose your partners and choose your partners carefully. Uh, if you choose your partners right, you've got a chance of the project going well. So, you know, that kind of leads us to Fox. Fox have been involved in this project since, since the very beginning and are an integral, um, an integral aspect of, of why I think this is going to be an extraordinary um, success. If anything, their ambition, as probably demonstrated by all of us being here today, is, is even greater than ours. Um, I mean, I think that ambition manifests itself in various guises. Um, you have, most obviously, probably the cast. Um, I mean, I find the cast extraordinary. Every time we, we kind of got another person on board, you think, well, that'll do, but then the next person will come, and they'd be even more stellar than the one who went before. Um, and I'm not just being nice about um, the Fox because uh, I am sat on the Venice Simple and Orient Express and they've just taken me to my favourite city, staying at my favourite hotel. Um, they have just been unbelievable partners all the way along. Um, you will see at various, I mean, at some point in the movie and you will see the kind of set, the trains they built. Um, they built two versions of the trains because as, as everyone's finding out filming inside these carriages is quite tricky um, and um, more than that I'd just like to kind of touch on two particular well a couple of pieces of talent that, that were attached to this project I think the first is Michael Green um, we by, by our very essence are, are in the ad adaptation business I think we would probably count ourselves as reasonably expert in adaptations a great adaptation is, is not merely a translation of, of a piece of work. Um, great writers kind of ingest the entire work. Um, and I, I've been looking for the right way of, of saying this next bit, but I haven't come up with one yet, so you'll have to put up with the word I use. And then they regurgitate it out into something that, that adds to the story, adds to the feeling. Um, and, and that's not changing the plot it's it's bringing something into both the medium that it's in because film is very different from book um, but also bringing it into the into the into the um, into the day that it is uh, that the audience is in I mean this is a period piece but it has an incredibly modern feel um, and I think you know Michael uh, got this project from the first draft I mean I think actually they shot something like the second draft which is almost unheard of um, and it's not just that he got the story and, and all those kind of basics about it. He got Poirot, and Poirot is, is sometimes 
um, misrepresented. Yes, he is um, fastidious. Yes, he is arrogant. Yes, he is incredibly intelligent. But he is also humorous. He's warm. And, and you have to like Poirot for the, for the story to work. And I think you will be pleasantly pleased with how much we like Ken as Poirot, which obviously leads us quite nicely to Ken, who, I mean, I don't really know what you say about Ken. Um, he, he is kind of all things to this film. He's producer, he's, he's director, he acts in Poirot. I didn't know whether he shot the whole thing as well. I mean, it is an extraordinary testament how he coped with the workload and how he has managed to create this, this extraordinary piece of work. I, um, I, will, I have no idea. Um, the final piece of talent I'd just like to, to little nod to um, is a young woman who, in 1928, first, first went on, on this train. And she was a young woman with an incredibly vivid imagination. And, and from those journeys and, dare I say it, her genius, came this incredible story of uh, murder on the Orient Express. Um, I would just make a small plea that when you are thinking about this project and talking about this project with this incredible cast that we are humbled to, to see assembled, you just occasionally go back to that creator, the person who, you know, without whom, well, we literally wouldn't be here, um, but actually nor would any of you in terms of, of this trip. Um, I, I know I'm biased, but I do think she was a genius. I think she... You know, there is a reason why people are still making um, Agatha Christie films, uh, and it is Agatha Christie. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Dad. Sorry I've talked too long, and I probably haven't been inspirational, but um, Dad has some uh, words from uh, his grandmother that, that he'd just quite like to share with you. My uh, role here, because I am older than him, is um, to talk a bit about uh, the origins of this wonderful story. Um, and uh, my grandmother always used to call all, the, all the, the works that she produced, she called them all stories because that was what she really wanted to do, is to write wonderful stories that, um, that, that all the people in the world could, could um, read and uh, they could shut themselves off for a few hours and really enjoy something um, and maybe take their mind off illness or a travel journey or whatever it was. And in uh, round about 1928, um, she sadly got divorced from my grandfather and she was going to go on a trip to try and recover to the West Indies and somebody told her, oh no, she shouldn't do that. She should go to Baghdad because that was a wonderful place and it would be so completely different and she'd be introduced to all sorts of people. So she went off uh, and she cancelled her trip to the West Indies and bought a ticket on the Orient Express. And that was the beginning of her love affair with trains. And about uh, two or three years after the first time she went on it, um, she was by then married to the person who became my step-grandfather, Max Mallowan, who is an archaeologist. And she had rather um, an interesting time. And what I'm about to read you um, is, in her own words, um, how she experienced the Orient Express. What a journey! Started out from Stamboul in a violent thunderstorm. We went very slowly during the night and about 3 a.m. stopped altogether. I thought we were at a frontier at about 8 o'clock. It seemed to me that even for a lower nation, the frontier halt was excessive. So I got up, discovered we were in the midst of nowhere, and perturbed officials hurrying up and down the train who said the line was flooded further along. It is a, an inundation, madame, but we know nothing. How often have we heard that? A chatty breakfast in the dining car ensued. All boys together, spirit. There was an elderly American lady who was catching the Aquitania at Cherbourg on the 16th. And a funny little Englishman from Smyrna, a little fussy man, but very interested in the archeology. span An old gentleman of 85 with a most amusing wife of 70 with a hideous but very attractive face. I think that, <laughs> I think they were Greek but they were some of the richest people in Istanbul and the old boy was going to attend a conference at Budapest. Sitting with them was the Hungarian minister and his wife and they all four talked, very entertaining diplomatic scandal in French. There were also two Danish lady missionaries who never seemed to be there because they had scant food and only came to breakfast. There was also, most fortunately, a director of the Wagon Lee company, but for his presence, I think we should be there still. 
He was in the same coach as I was, and everyone used to come and report to him. So I was always in the position of having inside information. I used to creep to the door and listen. Yes, Mr. Director. No, Mr. The Director. I know nothing. It got awfully cold after breakfast, and the engineer was sent off to bring back water and coal for the heating. We spent the morning wrapped up in rugs and the conductor fetched my hot water bottle and said that last time they had stayed in that particular place three weeks. He said that of course the passengers had got tired of it at last and had gone back to Stamboul. He said it was all very difficult because the line was washed away in three places, two of them in Greek territory and one in Turkish. And the question of who was to mend what was very complicated. Mrs. Smith, the American lady, was by now full of USA hustle. Why aren't they doing anything? Why, in the United States, they'd have hustled some automobiles along right away? Why, they'd have brought aeroplanes? Not in 1930, they wouldn't. However, the rumour went round that there was only going to be 12 hours delay and the heating was restored and we had lunch on our Lunch in Yugoslavia coupon and everybody was more cheerful. And then a rumour got about that we were going on a little way by train and then by car, so everyone packed up and put on warm things. We went on with Great A. Clark to the next station, Pythion, where Greek officers came aboard and with great politeness explained what was going to happen next. Well, the genius is that it isn't very far uh, from there to what actually happened in the book. And, I mean, for instance, the Mrs. Smith, the American lady, uh, you will find is called Mrs. Hubbard in the book, uh, and um, she will be played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, what is genius is that this story, um, the, the outline of which is, uh, it, I have just read to you, uh, and that's how she used to write her books. She used to write things and then, then adapt them. And that was allied with the story of uh, the Lindbergh kin kidnapping in America uh, when the poor little boy Charles was found, um, found decomposed four weeks after he was kidnapped from his family. And eventually they caught the criminal two or three years later, who I think in Germany, who'd stolen $50,000 and they'd been marked and they eventually tracked him down. The genius is perhaps not, not to associate murder with kidnapping or even changing the identities of people on a train. The genius is to put them together, to make these wonderful stories and this wonderful story, um, an adaptation of which we are going to see uh, this year. Um, she would have been delighted, I think, that Ken Branner uh, if he was here, would tell you that what he is tried to do is to adapt a story that was written in the 1930s. Uh, and I don't think you will find too much looking over the shoulder at previous adaptations, that some of which I've been responsible for. But that is really the genius of these stories. I think you'll find that the, huma the human nature of people is just the same now as it was in the 1930s when the book was written. And, and that in itself uh, is a little bit of genius. We get we get a lot of requests for doing things, and I think one of there are various reasons we are where we are. I think one of them was that we were set up as a business very early on, which means we were managed properly, which means that all the rights are, are properly held, and 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 we haven't lost lost things along the way. And the other one was that you know, and this is largely during Dad's tenure, that that we said no to a lot of things that that might have you know bled the life out of out of out of the value of the of the literary heritage. Um, it is about choosing the right projects. Um, we have very long-standing publishing relationships all over the world. Um, you know, we still sell something like four million books globally, um, globally each year. Um, we are published in more languages, I think, than any other author. Um, it's you know, we sell more books in foreign languages than English language. Um, it's it's a you know, it's an extraordinary life. I mean, we have TV, we have stage. Uh, we have these films. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's never the same. But um, there's a lot of, you know, we we are proactive as well as reactive. I mean, we do go out and and we have begun making this new series um, for the BBC, which started with and then there were none, uh, led to the witness for the prosecution, and we'll be filming Ordeal by Innocence later on this year. Um, that is something that we kind of made up and, and ran with and then you get you know the other way which is people coming to us. We've got seven films coming with the BBC which is in the line of and then there were none on the witness for the prosecution. We have, thank you, <laughs> we have Ordeal by Innocence coming later on this year and then um, there's also going to be a version of ABC Murders a bit further down the line. 
Uh, there is a Ben Affleck movie, um, which is kind of hovering into view. Um, these things always take slightly longer than you would like, but but hopefully that that will be um, that will be coming soon. And then there are various other things that are kind of before announcements. But there is a lot going on. Yes, I mean I think I said at the beginning, um, it is it is all about choosing the right partners. Um, and I think at the beginning we're probably very cautious and probably quite involved, um, and particularly at script stage. Um, if you've got the right script, you kind of, well, I was going to say you can't go wrong, you obviously can go wrong, but, but you've, you've got this, the key building block. Um, and what was extraordinary about this project was that kind of all the key people at a very early stage got it. Michael Green got it straight away. I mean, I think we're shooting something like the second draft, if, 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 if anything from there. Um, you know, he got Poirot straight away, he got the whole story. Um, in terms of, you know, the rest of it, I'm afraid you pick your partners and, and I'm, you know, there are people at Fox who know a lot more about casting and actors than I ever will um, and it's not my place, you know, once, you, once you've got the partner and you trust them, it, you might as well just let them do it because they'll do it a lot better than we will. James mentioned just then the magic word, it's called trust. Um, you know, the entertainment business isn't the only business where trust is important, but it's certainly one of them. And uh, I think at a fairly early stage, I think it was probably when Ken Branagh spent a couple of hours in our offices very early in the project, uh, James and I looked at each other and um, we reckoned, um, you know, that we could trust Fox and Kenneth Branagh to, to um, do this huge undertaking. And um, hopefully, um, touching a lot of wood, and there's a lot of wood in the <laughs> Orient Express. <laughs> Not a lot of it fake either, uh, which is yeah, rare these days. We, we, we were right. The first meeting we had, the thing that impressed me most, um, and it sounds very small, but it it's kind of says a lot, was he, he enacted what he saw as the opening sequence of the film. Now, this was actually a train coming down the tracks. So we were sat in our office with Ken Branagh pretending to be a train. <laughs> now, we were all wrapped. I mean, this was extraordinary. And I think it just told you that this, you know, he, he has a story, he has a vision, but the guy can act, because he can act to be a train in a way that a whole room, I mean, there were four or five of us in there, are completely glued. Um, I think there were lots of things. He was, he, he, I mean, he just got the story, he gets Poirot, um, and just is the most, you know, probably the most talented actor of his generation, certainly the most talented British actor of his generation. Um, there might be one or two other cast members who argue about it if you go global. Uh, but, you know, he is, I mean, I, I you know, uh, both of us, I think, are fairly biased about my great-grandmother and, and think that, she was a genius. I, I think Ken's probably not far off a genius. I mean, if you think about what he's achieved throughout these few months of shooting, I, I, I just dread to think what his brain has been through. I think the first moment that he appears on screen is going to be incredibly dramatic, um, because I think, I think there is what Ken is doing with the part is an, is an incredible thing, and I think there will be a massive wow factor with that first moment you see him. So that's mine, because that doesn't have to give away the plot. Without giving away the plot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do one. He sipped done one at the beginning. I'll do one at the end. Um, one of the great things about this story is that although uh, everything you see around you in this ca carriage, the opulence and the and the rich people who are who, who are most of the characters, or not, or not all of them, and all those two things are, I think, what uh, some people think this story is about. But right at the end, you discover that it's about something else as well. Mm. It's about justice. And that, to me, is very important. And I told Ken that at a very early stage. And I think you will find that he has been true to his word and not forgotten about the human values that are part of the story, as well as, so to speak, the physical values. I, I would like to think that most of you here, um, I would hope most of you here, had as nice and loving and family grandmother uh, as I did. Um, and um, of course, when I was very young, I didn't know how famous she was. But even when I began to know, that was probably when I was sort of 10 upwards, um, she ha we hardly ever talked about it at home. Uh, what we did talk about was what I was interested in at school. I played this funny game called cricket and she came to watch me. Um, you know, we, we, had, we had sort of family time in the summer when she'd finished her annual book. And, um, and you know, and I, I was on my school holidays. And those were some of the happiest times of my life. But I, I'm sorry to say that it had very little to do with literature. It had everything to do with a wonderful person who was a wonderful listener and took me, taught me everything that I now know about music and, and the arts and all that kind of thing, and, uh, and was a great judge of people. And um, I think that one of the reasons that 
um, this we're all sitting here um, 40 years after she died, is that being a judge of people, uh, I think, is something that probably James and me inherited to some extent. Because in this business, like in any other business, you can't afford to make too many mistakes. And um, I, I think this is, uh, this is uh, you know, one of the most wonderful things we've ever done. And I hope it gets, with, with your help, I hope it gets the su success it deserves. A great story is a great story wherever you come from. And I think that's what, that's what, that's what she lends to this. Um, what you can add on top is, is kind of a modern feel and, and some of that. And, but however, you have this incredible construct, which is, you know, which is why she works across time, why she works in so many different languages, um, and why she works in so many different medium to, mediums too. Um, it's, it's, I have this, this phrase which is based off um, a kind of Bill Clinton phrase, so please don't take it the wrong way. Um, but you know, it's the story, stupid. It is, it's, it's just all about the stories. Um, and, and it's very simple, but, but I think that is the answer.